some people just pretend that the, the problem's not there. Right, uh, I'm right. sorry, some people run from the problem. Some right. people, they pretend the problem's not there. And that's even worse than running from it, because then everybody can see that there's a problem but you. You're like the guy in the room with the spinach between his teeth, and everybody can see it but you, you know. Yeah. <laughs> um, so before you, can, before you can start looking for solutions, you've got to realize that there's a problem. The problem may be in your habits. The problem may be in your thinking. Uh, the problem might be in your social network, the people you hang around or the people you're not hanging around that you should be hanging around. Right. Um, so right. the first step in finding hidden solutions is, is finding that, that there's a problem, you know, and being willing to, to admit it. Right, right. Well, you know, I want to I want to I want to give praises to you for you know stepping up, doing the research, and having the curiosity to to want to do this kind of work because I I love it. This is right along what I'm talking about. When I saw this, I said, you know what, this is perfect for my show. This is a perfect book for my show. As a matter of fact, let me just say this. If I, if I didn't name my show uh, What's in Your Hand, another name for my show could be Hidden Solutions. Yeah, that's exactly right. And, and when I found out that your, that your show was called What's in Your Hand, you know, the first story I thought of was, was that story about Moses because a lot of people don't realize that the solution is right in front of them. It's right in their hand. It's sitting on their, on their desk. It's looking them in the mirror, and they don't see it. And there's, there's some historical reasons why they don't see it. And the reason I wrote the book is to open people's eyes to start seeing the solutions that are literally right in front of them. And there's some steps you can go through to start opening your eyes and seeing those solutions. Because what I found after seven years of research is that for most people, the solution is closer than they think. And, and many times it's right in front of them, and they're not seeing it. So how do you open the eye of the brain to start seeing the very solutions that you've been looking for for years and, and you know, the answers are usually close by the right in front of you most of the time. Mm-hmm. You mean like uh, Rosie Couturez, who came out, she was so poor, couldn't barely take care of her family, came out of the house and saw a pile of trash, and she turned that trash into treasure. You mean like that? Yeah, that was right outside of San Antonio. I grew up in San Antonio, and um, in the 1960s, there was a little town called Shirts. It was a suburb of San Antonio, and they didn't have the municipal trash pickups, so everybody just kind of was on their own. They'd put their trash in their front yard, or, or they would take it to the dump on their own. And uh, Rosie was, was dirt poor, you know, and uh, every morning she'd get up and she'd pray, God, you know, please help me to find a way to put my kids through college so they won't end up poor like I am. And um, and one day she looked across the street, you know, she got up off her knees and she wiped her, her eyes or tears with her apron, and she saw a big pile of trash. And on that day, she saw something she'd never seen before. Well, you know, she'd always seen the trash. The trash was there every day. But on this day, she saw a problem that needed a solution. And so she went over across the street, knocked on the door, and, and said to the guy, hey, you know, can I take your, your trash to the dump for a dollar? And he says, well, sure, you know, if you want. you got nothing better to do. Go ahead. So with, with no equipment, with no training, and no special tools, just by hand, she took uh, each, each piece of trash, put it in the trunk of her car, and it took her two days to take all that junk to the, to the trash dump. And after a few days, you know, people looked around, and they looked at this guy's yard, and, and they said, wow, what happened? You know, where did all this guy's trash go? And, and they asked the guy, you know, how did you get rid of all your trash? And he goes, well, Rosie did it. Rosie, who's Rosie? What's well, that little lady across the street? And people began to ask Rosie, hey, next time you go to the dump, can you take my, my trash to the dump, too? And she said, sure. And, and so little by little, she started taking other people's trash to the dump. Now, this is a, a nasty, gross, hard work uh, kind of project, but she did it. And um, after a while, you know, her husband had to quit his job to help her in her new business. And they had to buy an old beat-up pickup truck to help them take the trash. And then they bought another pickup truck and another one and another one. Mm-mm. And pretty soon, they had a whole fleet of trucks with the big letters on them says, that says Gutierrez Garbage Hauling on the side of them. And um, eventually, the city of Shirts put out a request for bids. They said, okay, we think it's time to start having our own municipal trash pickup, and uh, we're going we're gonna to let you bid, all you big garbage, haul- garbage haulers who want you to bid. And, and to Rosie's utter shock and surprise, she submitted a bid, and she won the bid. And uh, she was able to put her kids through college and became very wealthy, only because she saw a solution that nobody else saw. But that came because she first saw a problem that nobody else thought was a problem. And, uh, of course, it started with prayer, you know. 
But, um, yeah, those kind of solutions are all around us if you just look for them. Mm-hmm. And you know what's a great story? Arsala McCarty. Her story was incredible. A cleaning lady. She was a cleaning lady, right? Oh, yeah. And she saved that money and donated that money to the college. And I thought that was just a powerful, powerful story. She's oh, yeah, Osceola. She's she's one of my favorite people on the planet. I've never met her, but, man, I sure hope I do one day. You know, she grew up, she, she just washed clothes all her life. And, you know, she had a pig named Pig and a cow named Cow. <laughs> a very simple life, very humble woman. And she didn't go to crazy parties. She didn't, she didn't spend her money on expensive clothes or cars. She just saved her money. Saved her money, and one day when she was in her 80s, she walked into her local college, and um, and she said, I want to donate some money to the, to scholarships. And they said, okay, how much do you got? And they, they were expecting, you know, 100 bucks, maybe 200 bucks. She donated $250,000 of her life savings. And and people said, well, why are you doing this? And she said, because I want other other young people to have opportunities that I never had. We're living in a new world now. And there's not much I can do, but but she answered the question, "What's in your hand?" By saying, "This is what I had in my hand. I I was able to do a little bit with what I had, washing clothes my whole life, and now I've got a little bit saved up, and I want to help other people." And she changed a lot of people's lives with that donation. Amazing woman. Yeah, another one who I really admire, and I kind of met briefly once, was uh, Kathy Hughes. Oh yeah, she's got an incredible yeah. story. Single yeah, mom. Kathy Hughes was was an amazing woman. It still is an amazing woman. You know, she was she she had a passion for radio like you do, Rick. Yes. And and um, you know, she started off. You know, she was a single mom, and you know, she she was evicted from an, from her apartment. She was working just as a helper at this radio station. You know, just doing odd jobs and and uh, just cleaning out the offices and things like that. And when she got evicted, you know, she would go and sleep in the studio of the radio station uh, because she didn't have any place else to sleep. And, you know, she was such a hard worker and so enthusiastic that they gave her another job and another job and another job. And eventually, you know, she said you know, the, the radio was having, the radio station was having problems financially because they weren't reaching the right audiences. They were not giving the people what they needed. And, um, and so she said, well, I have an idea, you know. And, and so she walked into her local bank and said, I want to I buy this radio station. You know, it's in bankruptcy and I want to buy it. And, and, so many bankers just laughed at her, and they looked at her and said, are you out of your mind? You know, this is going to cost at least a million dollars. But she kept knocking on doors and knocking on doors and sharing her passion, and eventually somebody said yes. And she bought that radio station and turned it into a talk show program and then expanded wow. that radio station. And nice. she's got one of the biggest radio programming networks in the whole world right now. It's an amazing story. Nice. That's nice. That's nice. Really nice. You yeah. Know, you know, stories like that, is an inspiration and let you know that it can be done. Yeah, it's basically, you know, how bad do you want it and are you willing to do what it takes to to, to solve those problems, you know? And here's here's the reason that I know that there's a solution to whatever you're paying, to whatever you're facing out there, guys. This goes back to a trip I took to the Amazon jungle um about 8 years ago. I was backpacking in the jungle and my my native uh, guide there, he was an indigenous guy who grew up in the jungles. He'd walked us only about 100 yards into the jungle, and in that first 100 yards, he'd already showed us 10 things that could either kill us or severely injure us. And we were going to be there a whole week, so I was going, wow, this is going to be a dangerous week, man. But in that same 100 yards, he also showed us things that could cure us or heal us of what had just harmed us. And I thought, well, that's kind of weird, you know. And, and so for a solid week, every time he showed us some, some thorn, some ant, some bee, some, some creature that could harm us or kill us, right around the corner, it was usually within 10 or 20 yards, there was something that could cure us of what had just harmed us. And I asked him, I said, hey, isn't that weird? I mean, every time you show us something that, could, that can kill us, just nearby there's, there's some plant or some leaf or some mud contraption, you know, con- concoction that we can apply to the injury that will heal us. I said, well, isn't that weird to you? And he goes, that's not weird, man. How do you think that my ancestors survived in the jungles for thousands of years without modern medicine or doctors? And then he told me his, his grandfather lived to be 98 years old and never left the jungle. And it was in that moment as though the universe were screaming to me, Dan, you see, there is no such thing as a problem without a solution because the universe has, has declared, that's almost like a universal principle, like the law of gravity, there shall be no such thing as a problem without a solution. 
And so if we go into life armed with that power, armed with that knowledge that there is no such thing as a problem without a solution, then we wake up excited because we know that somewhere nearby there's a solution, there's an answer. We just have to learn to open the eye of the brain and start seeing these solutions. The eye of the brain. That's beautiful. The eye of the brain. Yeah. Uh, Someone submitted a question that says, if you have an out-of-the-box idea that may not be popular in public opinion, what would be the main thing needed to sell the idea to a sponsor for funding? Well, the first thing you got to do is you got to believe that your idea is capable of changing the world, or at least changing some part of the world. Because if you don't believe it, then the sponsors aren't going to believe it. You can't you can't get, go into a corporate sponsor and say, "Hey, I have an idea. It's kind of a lousy idea, but you know, will you will you buy it? Will you sponsor it, or whatever?" You have they have to see the passion in your eye. Because I work with a lot of investors, and I'm an investor myself. And the first question I'm going to ask anybody is, you know, how much do you have invested in this? How much time have you put into it? How much of your own money have you put into it? Because before they put a dime into it, they're going to want to know that you have a dime in it. Before they put a dollar in it, they're going to want to know you have a dollar in it. Before they put a million dollars in it, they're going to want to know you have put at least a million dollars in it. And it may not be a million dollars in cash. It may be a million dollars in time and effort. Um, and, and so that's the first step is how much do you believe in it? And then, you know, don't just go randomly to an investor and say, hey, do you want to, do you want to invest in this product? You have to do your homework. That's where a lot of people fail. They, they throw ideas against the wall hoping they'll stick. And, you know, it's very random, and they go, well, that didn't work. Let's try this, and they throw another one against the wall. But, but before you start doing that, you have to do your homework. Is there a market for this product? Is anybody going to want it? How do you know there's a market? Have you done your, your homework? Have you test marketed the product or the idea? Uh, do you have a following? You know, and, and fortunately, we're living in one of the days and time in history that's, that's beautiful because you can test market your products on Facebook on Instagram, on, on uh, Pinterest, in so many different ways that there, there should be no accidental discoveries. You should be able to go to your investors and say, look, I've got a following of 500,000 people who already love this idea, who already love this product. And, um, you know, you've got to be able to prove to the investor that somebody's going to want this. And, and you can't base that just on a wish and a hope. You have to show them, yeah, I've got, you know, 500,000 people that are already interested in this product. And here's the proof. You know, here's my email following. Here's my Facebook following. Here's my Pinterest following or my, my, tweet, my tweet followers. Um, so you have to do the grassroots work, knock on doors, cold call your neighbors. Um, there was a guy in, uh, in New York City. Um, he's in my book, too. I forget his name right now, but he was a Mexican guy. And um, he started, you know, his wife made the best homemade tortillas, he, he said. You know, the best homemade tortillas. Well, everybody's, everybody says that about their wife, you know. <laughs> but this guy really believed it, and he started knocking on doors, saying, hey, you want to buy some homemade tortillas? And people said yes. And, and so, you know, he developed a little following in his neighborhood. And then he walked into a local uh, convenience store on the corner and said, hey, everybody in the neighborhood, you know, buys my tortillas. Here's how many I'm selling every week right now. And I said, really? You got proof for that? And he showed him his book and go, yeah, okay, well, yeah, we'll carry your tortillas in our little convenience store. And he um, yeah, just grew, 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 and he's got one of the biggest tortilla factories in the country right now because he didn't just believe his wife had the best tortillas on the planet. He proved it by going door to door. You have to start a grassroots movement. You have to prove that people love your product or your service before you go to the big boys because they're going to want proof. So that's that's my two cents worth. If you've got a product, is you've got to start small. Okay. So we're going to start small. What What is the best way, do you think, to start teaching young people, our children, about entrepreneurship and looking for solutions instead of uh, running away from, from problems? Wow, wow. You've really hit a topic that, that I have a lot of passion for because – I have a, a series of articles that I've written called Raising Steve Jobs, what every <laughs> parent should be teaching their children about entrepreneurship. Mm-hmm. Because, Rick, we're living in a day, you know, where, where people your age and my age, you know, we, we tried corporate America, we, we went to college, or we went to the right high school, we, we made good grades, and we got a good job, and then eventually corporate America kicked us to the curb because, because they found some machine or some computer to do our job, or they thought we were too old or whatever. And so, you know, one of my missions is to go around the country teaching parents 
what they should be teaching their children about entrepreneurship. So, for example, one of the things that we were taught was to study hard, make good grades, do your homework, so you can go to college and graduate and get a good job, right? Mm -hmm. Well, we teach our children how to write a resume. You know, that's the thing I get asked a lot. You know, Dan, can you look at my friend's resume? Tell me what they can improve on to get a good job. And I tell parents the same thing. Look, when you teach your child how to write a good resume, you think you're doing something right Mm -hmm. because that's what you were taught. But what hidden message are you teaching them? You're teaching them that their best and highest purpose is to get a job. Right. Right? Mm -hmm. Get a job for corporate America. Get a job at Starbucks. Get a job at IBM. Get a job at at Dell. Okay? So what we should be teaching our children is not how to write a good resume, but how to write a good business plan. How do you start your own radio show? Mm -hmm. How do you start your own coffee shop? You know, how do you find investors? How do you find office space? Because when we teach them how to write a business plan, we're sending them a different message. This message is, you know what, I believe in you. I believe one day you're going to own your own company. I believe that one day you're going to have 100 employees. You're going to have your own fleet of cars. You're going to have your own equipment. So let's train our kids how to write a business plan, how to find investors, and how to find office space. That's one of the things that will plant that hidden message. We should be brainwashing our children towards success instead of brainwashing them towards working for other people. Right. Wow. That That, that is powerful. Now, what if, say... You're in the fourth quarter of your life, and you, you know you're up there in age. Should you give up? And say, oh, I had my chance. I didn't do it, so it's over for me. Should I say that? Wow, wow. Man, there's so many people that do that, Rick, and it's so sad because they don't know the the heroes that have come before them. People in the '50s and '60s, like Ray Kroc, who who created McDonald's. Now think about this: if you're if you're in if in your mid '50s or late '50s or beyond that. You know, you think it's too late for me. You know, right now I just want to get the best job I can. I want to be a greeter at Walmart or get a get a job at, at at Starbucks or something easy. I don't want too much stress in my life. I already got my pension or my or my uh, my Social Security, and now I just want a little extra income. Well, Ray Kroc, instead of doing that, he started McDonald's. You don't start McDonald's when you're 55, 65 years old. Are you crazy? <laughs> and and look at Colonel Sanders. He was 65 years old when he started uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken. And, you know, to talk about what's in your hand, you know, if you asked Colonel Sanders back then, hey, what's in your hand, Colonel? All he had was a chicken recipe. Mm -hmm. Are you out of your mind? All you have is a chicken recipe? No, I'm not going to hire you. We know how to cook chicken. You know, everybody knows how to cook chicken. But all he had was a chicken recipe and an idea. His idea was to sell franchises. And at 65 years old, he stepped in his car, and he went knocking on the door saying, hey, I've got a pretty good chicken recipe and an idea. And he started the Kentucky Fried Chicken franchise, which is global. You can go to any country on the planet, and there's a Kentucky Fried Chicken there. This guy was 65 years old. Are you nuts? You don't start a new company when you're 65 years old. But this guy was just crazy enough to believe he could. And so was Ray Kroc, who started McDonald's. So, no, it's never too late, you know. And, and like I said, the worst thing you can do is give up on your dreams and give up on your ideas. And the best thing you can do is to believe in them and to believe you can accomplish them because there is no such thing as a problem without a solution. Okay, well, let's have a little bit of fun. Uh, I'm going to put $100 in your pocket, Dan Castro. Okay. And 100 bucks in your pocket, and we're going to put you in a city where you don't know anyone. You're a okay. stranger. You don't know anyone. You can't get on the phone and call the wife, the uncle, the father, the mother. No lifeline. you got to work it on your skills and talents. you got to work yeah. that city. And you got to work that hundred bucks. You got to you got to eat with that money, and you got to find a place to live with that money. In a, in a strange city, he knows no one. What is Daniel Castro going to do with that hundred bucks to survive? How, what is he What is he going to do? Well, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to to find a lifeline um, that's called the internet. Okay, and I can do that at a local library. I know that because I've taught homeless people how to do this. You go to the local library, you get on the Internet, you create a Facebook account, you create an email account, you create uh, a LinkedIn account, all the different net social networking tools that are out there. And with those tools, you're going to find a local meetup group of something that, that interests you. For example, real estate or, or some, other, some other thing that you're passionate about. Mm-hmm. And you're going to start going to those meetings. Now, you've only got 100 bucks, right? Mm-hmm. So some of these groups require 10 bucks entry fee. You're going to use your first 10 bucks there. You're going to collect... 100 business cards at those meetings, 
and you're going to take those those business cards. You're going to go back home. You're going to you're going to put them in your email list, and you're going to you're going to email those people, and you're going to say, "Hey, I met you at this event. Can I buy you a cup of coffee?" That's where your first money is going to go to is building relationships. They're going to go well. You know, there's nobody that I've ever done this with, and I do this today. And I've got a little bit more than a hundred bucks in my pocket. Every time <laughs> I go to a networking event, I, I collect as many business cards as I can. I go back home. And I send them an email, and I say the same thing. Hey, I met you last night. I would love to get to know you better. Can I buy you a cup of coffee? Now, why am I doing that? Well, the first thing is that nobody's ever going to say no to a cup of coffee. And if you flatter them a little bit and say, you know, you're, you're, you're a really smart guy. You seem like you have a lot going on. You know, I just want to get to know you. I want to be your friend. Nobody's going to say no to that because they love flattery. Why am I doing this? Because I'm building my network. I want to know the people that are already successful at what I want to do. Because that's where my mentors are going to come from. That's where my training is going to come from. That's where my first business opportunities are going to come from. And I've built five different companies doing this exact same thing. And none of it required money except for the cup of coffee. Because, you know, if you go to Starbucks, that's four bucks. So maybe I want to start out someplace like McDonald's, <laughs> someplace where it's still a buck, you know. Um, but but the, the best thing you can do is, you know, you don't go out and buy the biggest, most expensive cheeseburger you can because you're starving, you know. Uh, you can get by on very little, and, and there's so many different places to, to eat food around town. Any city has places where they'll feed, they'll feed people who don't have food, so you don't even want to spend that money on food. Um, you know, so you want to, you're going to spend it building your network and building relationships. And I always tell all my clients and all my, my students, because I teach entrepreneurship, that the, the most important asset that you have is your relationships, because that's going to be the people you partner with. Those are going to be your first clients. And let's say that, that you've got a widget, some widget you've invented, some, some idea, some concept, you know, like that person who asked that question, what do I do with this idea? How do I get investors? Well, after, if you've built your network and you've got, you know, let's say you've got, you've been doing this for a while, you've got a thousand people in your email group now, you send them all, all an email and say, hey, I've got this product. I want to do a demonstration for you. Um, come to my house, come to my neighbor's house. If you don't have a house, if you're homeless or whatever, you know, you can you can ask a friend or a family member or a local church to, to open their doors to you. They just want to have a meeting. I want to show people this product. And if you've got that many people that already like you because you've been building relationships, they'll show up. They'll show up for no other reason to make you feel good, you know, because you're trying something that's outside the box. And you'd be shocked at how many people are going to support you and how many people are going to buy that widget just to help you out. And um, it, it's crazy, but that's what I would do with my first hundred bucks. That's awesome. Let me, let me identify ourselves, Daniel. WHCR 90.3 FM, New York. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Rick Young. This is What's in Your Hand here at WHCR 90.3 FM, the voice of Harlem. And my guest today is Daniel R. Castro, and he's the author of a book, Hidden Solutions All Around You, Why some people can see them and some can't. And Daniel, some of the people, you like to be called Daniel or Dan? Dan. Dan, okay. Uh, Dan, yeah. on the cover of the book, some of the people you have, I'm just going to name a few. Steve yep. Jobs, Bill Gates, Michael Dell, Thomas Edison, Albert Einstein, Henry Ford, Coco Chanel, Estee Lauder, Mary, Mary Kay Ash, Paul McCartney, Mark Zuckerberg, Jeff Bezos, Leonardo da Vinci, Ray Kroc, uh, Colonel Sanders, Kathy Hughes, Oprah Winfrey, and Richard Branson. I, and the few names that I don't recognize, how it shows from Starbucks. Uh, if you had to take one of those people, one, and you had to model that person, or you would want to model out of the names you have here, who would you pick? For me personally, yes. Wow, um, I I would say that the guy that I relate to more than anybody else here is a guy named Herb Kelleher. Now, many people don't know that name, Herb Kelleher. But they know the name Southwest Airlines, okay? <laughs> so if you're out there listening, I'm going to say, have you ever heard of Southwest Airlines? Let me tell you uh -huh. about Herb Kelleher because he's got an amazing story. And people don't know this story. Okay, so, he, you know, he's in San Antonio. Um, he was a local attorney, so he did the hard work. You know, he went to law school and all that. But he wasn't big or rich or famous. He was just a local attorney. And he comes home one day and he tells his wife, wife, I'm going to shut down my law practice. I'm going to leave everything behind. And I'm going to start an airline. Now, this was in the early 60s, so you got to think about what he's saying here. In the early 60s, the only people that could afford airline tickets were the rich 
the business executives and the movie stars. He himself had only been on an airplane once, and that's because the client paid for it. And his wife looked at him and said, are you out of your mind? <laughs> she said, have you ever been on an airplane? And he goes, yeah, once. She goes, well, okay, that's not enough, dude. Have, do you know anybody that works in the airline industry? No. Um, mm. Can we afford an airplane? No. Do you have some airplane that your uncle left you that you haven't told me about? No. Um, do you, uh, have you, are you going to airplane school? Are you going to get a pilot license? No. And finally, she looked at him and, and said, I'm going to ask you a question. I want you to be very honest with me. She took him, his hands in her hands, looked him straight in the eyes. She said, Herb, be honest with me. Have you been taking your medication? <laughs> 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 and, and he said, no, because I, I don't need no medication. But anyway, so he came up with an idea to start a new airline that was very different from what anybody else had been doing. It was only going to fly in Texas. And because of that, he was going to cut his costs almost nothing. And this was going to be the cheapest airline that anybody could fly on. And, um, and he started passing out peanuts on every flight because he said, this flight costs you peanuts. And he used it like a bus system. So anybody that could afford a bus, th- bus ticket from San Antonio to Houston or from San Antonio to Dallas could afford his ticket. Uh. And, and because of that concept, he undercut the big airlines you know, by thousands of dollars, and, and people in Texas went, man, this is crazy. Why would you fly any on any other airline other than this one when you can afford it's the same price as a bus ticket, right? Or yeah. maybe a little bit higher, but not much. Uh-huh. And, and of course, from there he expanded, and he, he started flying from, from Texas to other states and other states, and now you can get a Southwest Airline ticket to anywhere in the country. And he's about to start flying to Costa Rica, which is good, because that's where I like to go. But anyway, um, and, and I tell that story because... So many of us are satisfied with what we've got. Let's say, let's say you, you've got a good job. It's okay. It's paying the bills. You know, you're not where you want to be, but it's okay. You know, you can you can live you can do the rest of your life on this amount of money and doing this job. Maybe it's not the best job. Maybe you, there's days you hate it, but you'd rather be doing something else. You're passionate about something else, but you're afraid to give up your day job. You know, and I can understand the logic of not giving up your day job, but I tell this story because here was a guy. And um, um, there's other people in history that have done this, too. Um, the guy that started Starbucks, Howard Schultz, did the, the exact same thing. Had a pretty good day job, and, and, but that wasn't his passion. And he said, you know what? Today is the day I'm drawing the line in the sand. I am going to accomplish my dreams. I'm going to give up everything. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do whatever it takes to start this new industry, whether it's, it's a coffee shop or an airline or whatever it is, I'm going to sell out, and I'm going to go, and I'm going to reach the promised land, because what is in your hand? What is in your hand right now is a hope and a dream and a promise that if you do the hard work and you turn over enough stones, if you build your network, you are going to reach the promised land. But the first step is you've got to believe that a solution exists and that you can be more than you are and that you can do more than you're right now. Mm, yeah, I love that. I got a guy, uh, he's, a, he's a DJ. And he plays a lot of Bob Marley music. Yeah. And I tell him, you know, he's been doing it for like 20, 25 years, something like that, for a long time. And I'm saying there's an opportunity here for you. I don't, I don't know exactly uh, how to, uh, you know, what, what's the next move for him to do. But, I mean, because the family, you know, they're pretty tight on Bob Marley's name and stuff like that. But what in a situation like that, how could he – uh, could he do something to say how how Bob Marley affected his life and do like a documentary or something like that? Or what could he do? In your opinion, you're saying you're saying that he wants to do more than what he's doing now. Yeah, he's he's a DJ, uh, DJ at a radio station. Actually, he's here, but I guess he wants to go to another level and and turn it into uh, income. So, uh, what, what would you do in a case like that? I mean, he's got a lot of Bob Marley music been dedicated to him and playing his music. You know, a lot of songs I never heard until I came yeah. here and started hearing heard him playing them. Yeah, you know, for, for people like that, and I, I know people like that, too. They're very passionate about something, and a lot of people are passionate about it, too. And you got to be careful there because, you know, some of the things that we're passionate about is not going to put much money in our pocket. Right. You know, okay. you have to do the market research. For example, I love to salsa dance, okay? I've been okay. salsa dancing <laughs> about six years now. Okay. After my dad passed away, I wanted to get in touch with my inner Latino, you know, so I took salsa dancing <laughs> lessons. And it became not just a passion, but an addiction, you know? And then I learned how to play bongo drums because I wanted to really get into it. And, you know, I yeah, it's something I love to do. 
and, and there's a, there's books out there that say if, if this is your passion, if you love to do it, then you can make a living out of it, and you can become a millionaire. Okay, well, you got to take that with a grain of salt, guys, because, you know, as much as I love the salsa dance, I don't think that, that salsa dancing is going to put, put money in my family's pocket. I don't think that's going to put bread on the table. Now, it doesn't mean that I can't earn a little money teaching salsa classes. You can do that. Um, and this guy's found a way to make a living, you know, playing, playing Bob Marley songs, and that's great. And people love Bob Marley all over the planet, right? Right. And, right. you know, I could give him the standard answers that, that any um, entrepreneur would give him. Well, you know, you can sell Bob Marley T-shirts. You can, you can write a book about Bob Marley. You can, um, you can put, you know, Bob Marley pictures on a hat, you know. But, the, see, the thing is, you've got to do your market research. All that's been done. And, and so I would say to your friend, you know, Everything that you want to do with Bob Marley has already been done. So if you want to go to the next level, you got to do something that nobody else has done. Okay, uh, now uh -huh. you know what I'm saying. Uh -huh. So you know you got to be careful with this this idea that whatever you love, you know you can become a billionaire doing it. Because you know, for example, in high school, I love basketball. I mean, I slept with my basketball. I I could spin a basketball on all ten fingers. You know, I could dribble basketball. I could make shots from from three point range all day long. But I was only five foot ten, uh -huh. <laughs> and on my basketball team, there were guys that were already six foot four. Okay, okay, <laughs> and you know, so if I followed the test that says, well, if you're passionate about it, you know, you can become a superstar, I'd be starving today, because you know, God has blessed certain people with certain gifts and talents that He hasn't blessed other people with. So you have to ask yourself, what's in my hand? What is it that I'm good at? Well, Dan, and, there's a guy named Steph Curry now. I mean, come on. He, oh, yeah. How tall, how tall is Steph oh, Curry? Yeah. He's not that tall now. Well, now he's six, six foot four. Isn't he? Yes. He, isn't he? Yeah, that's tall, man. I mean, compared to what I am, that's oh, tall. Oh, he's six four? I mean, but yeah. the way he shoots now, I mean, come on. The way he shoots, he can shoot that oh, ball. Oh, yeah. Yeah, now, now he shoots lights out, but, but you got to remember the way he plays basketball. He asked himself, what's in my hand? What can I do that nobody else can do? Or what can I develop that nobody else has developed? And he developed a way to dribble the ball that allows him to separate himself from the defender. And all you got to do is watch some of the highlight clips uh -huh. because you're right, he's not the tallest guy on the court. But what is it that he's doing that nobody else is doing? He found a way to create space. And all you need is a couple of feet. Michael Jordan taught us that, right? Uh -huh. If you watch Steph Curry, you go, why is this guy so successful? Why are people saying that he's the best basketball player on the planet, not LeBron James anymore, they're saying this guy. Right. The reason is because this guy said, what's in my hand? I'm not that big. I'm not that, that muscular. I'm not Shaquille O'Neal. I'm not LeBron James. I can't bench press 350 pounds. I'm a little guy, but watch this. Mm -hmm. And he, he shoots like out because he first creates that space. Mm -hmm. right? And sometimes all you need in life is that little bit of space. All you need is an advantage. A small edge, because if you apply that small edge over and over and over and over again, pretty soon you'll be miles ahead of the competition. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And and so yeah. for your for your DJ friend, I would say, what's your edge? What is the small thing that you can do that nobody else is doing? Because by definition, if you do the same thing everybody else is doing, guess where you're going to be with everybody else with the masses. Have you ever you heard? Find your edge. Have you ever heard of USP? USP, U no. Unique unique selling proposition. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, unique selling proposition. So yeah. that's the same, pretty much the same thing, right? Well, it is, but, but that phrase has been so overused, you know, because, you know, we teach that in corporate America, and every, every, they sell that, they, they teach that to all the sales reps. And you show up on day one uh, at some sales school, they're going to say, what's your unique selling proposition? Everybody's going to write on the whiteboard. Okay. Well, my unique selling proposition is this. And, and, you know, it's true, but it's a little bit overdone. So when I teach people, I say, What's your unfair advantage? What are you going to do different that nobody else is doing? Because, you know, if somebody were to, to, to look at your friend, for example, the DJ, and say, what is it that you're doing that nobody else is doing? He may not have an answer for that. He may go, well, I don't know, I play Bob Marley music. Well, a lot of people play Bob Marley music. So it's not necessarily what you're doing now that nobody else is doing. It's what should you be doing that nobody else is doing. Because the problem that a lot of us have is we've been doing life the same way we've been doing it for years. And it's enough. It pays the bills. It's okay. You know, we're not rich, but, but we get by. Mm -hmm. and, and so the question is not what are you doing right now that's unique. It's what could you be doing? What should you be doing that nobody else is doing? And Steph Curry answered that question by saying, watch this. Because he had developed that. 
Now, you got to think about this. All these kids that go to the same basketball camps, they have, relatively speaking, the same kind of basketball coaches. They didn't teach him that move, did they? He taught himself that move. Watch some of those highlight clips. So the question is, what can you be doing? What should you be doing to give yourself an unfair advantage, to give yourself that edge? that if you apply over and over and over, is going to put you light years ahead of the competition. Well, one of the things he does, he practices with dribbling two basketballs. Yeah. That's one thing. And also has someone throw a little small, like, Spalding kind of ball, and he catches it while he's dribbling two balls. So, oh, my Lord. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that, that's, oh, that's on YouTube. I mean, this guy, this guy's amazing. Yeah. I'm really liking this guy. Yeah. And I like the way he carries himself, too. Yeah, he's very humble, you know. Um, he's You know, you can look at his face. And see the face of humility and integrity. Yeah. You, know, you can see this in your eye. And, He's got the you, know, you look at some He's of the other basketball players around around the country, and just look at their face. You know, look at them when they're in their interviews, and you can tell an attitude that's teachable, that's coachable, and that's humble. And the difference between that and somebody that thinks they're God's gift to basketball, you know, and it's the same in life and in business. You know, the people that are the most humble, the most coachable, the most trainable are the ones that are the most successful. It's not the ones that are bragging, not the ones with the best suits, the best cars. Um, you know, it's the guys that are willing to drive the beat up cars, um, save enough money until they get where they want to be. You know, those are the people that you want to help out. Uh, let me identify ourselves again, uh, Daniel. WHCR, 90.3 FM, New York. And I said, Daniel, I know you like Dan. Ladies and gentlemen, right. my name is Rick Young. This is another segment of What's in Your Hand here at WH. CR 90.3 FM, Voice of Harlem, and my guest today, the author of Hidden Solutions All Around You, Why Some People Can See Them and Some Can't, Dan R. Castro. Dan, I think there should be hidden solution clubs all over the world. What do you think about that? Wow. Wow. Now you're talking my language, man. <laughs> no, because I think, I think, that, I think that that's, what was just, that's what's needed. Yeah. I think that's what's yeah. needed. We need... Hidden solution clubs all over. I was going to say the country. But I said no, no, the world, the world. Yeah, and we can start in our in our local neighborhoods, you know. And I'm willing to part with, partner with you on that if you want if you want to brainstorm that idea. Because, for example, I was part of an organization called Teen Leadership Austin, and I was one of the, the chairmen. And we would take kids out of high school and put them through a year long leadership training program. And what we were doing. One of the things we were doing was teaching them entrepreneurship and how to solve people's problems uh, because it's, it starts with brainwashing yourself and then brainwashing your children towards success, towards solving people's problems. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you, you talked about what can we be teaching our kids earlier. You know, one of the things we can teach our kids that's very, very critical is that more money comes from solving other people's problems than performing other people's tasks. That's very important. Okay. Very, very important distinction, okay, because you can teach people how to perform tasks. You can teach them how to flip burgers. You can teach them how to pour a cup of coffee. You can teach them how to change a tire. You can teach them um, how to do all kinds of things that are very important, mm -hmm. you know, very necessary in society. But those positions and those jobs, even though they're necessary and critical for society, they only pay so much. We know that, right? And we need to be teaching our kids that they can make more money by solving other people's problems than they can by performing other people's tasks. Wow. And that's a huge distinction because the people that make more money in, the soci in this society and in every country on the planet are the people that are solving other people's problems. They're not just performing tasks. Huge, huge difference in their, in their thinking, right? Mm -hmm. So when you get up out of bed and you think, how come I'm not making more money? What I tell my students and my clients is if you're running out of, out of business, it's not because you're running out of clients. It's because you're running out of problems to solve. <laughs> you know? <laughs> I like that. I like that. Uh, Dan, give me your ideal client. What does your, your ideal client look like? Wow. My ideal client is, is somebody, I have a lot of these. They, they come to me, and they're excited. They wake up excited. They don't have much money, but that's okay because I grew up dirt poor, too. And, and they say, Dan, teach me, coach me, train me. What can I do to be where you are, okay? Huh. And, and I say, what are you willing to do? And they say, I'll do anything. And I say, how hard are you willing to work? And they say, I'll, I'll work 24-7. And I say, are you willing to, to read the books I'm going to recommend to you? And they say, yes, what's your, what's your library? You know, show me the list. And, um, 
you know, and people people all the time ask me, well, where should I be investing my money? You know, I've got a, I've got a couple hundred bucks I saved up. You know, where should I invest? And you, you're the investor guy. Where should I invest? And I say the best thing you can do with that couple hundred bucks is invest in yourself. Mm. Invest in education mm. and training. You find something you're passionate about. Find mm. a seminar. Find a workbook. Find a mentor, and say, how can I learn what you're what you're learning? Where did you go to school? What books did you read? What networking groups did you go to? I want to go to those. Those are my favorite clients, and I've been blessed to have a lot of those. And, and I love those because at the end of the day, at the end of the year, they're going to come to me, and they're going to write me letters. They're going to call me. They're going to take me to dinner, and they go, Dan, let me tell you what I accomplished last year. Let me tell you what I accomplished last month. And it's awesome. their success. Awesome. It's not mine. It's theirs. Yeah. But, but I love it because they're bragging on themselves using the principles and the techniques that I taught them. So there's not a better feeling in the world, man. How how far is Houston from Austin, Texas? It's about a three hour drive. Okay, all right. Because my sister just moved to Houston. Yeah, yeah, it's not bad. Okay, all right. Now, how often do you come to New York City? You know what? I come there as often as I need to come there. Um, I I was there a few uh, just about a couple of months ago, but I've got lots of friends and clients up there. And uh, if there's a need, if there's an opportunity, I'll come up there every week if I have to. It doesn't matter. Okay, if you if you have any 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 potential uh opportunities to come to New York, let me know because I get a small group of people and we could have a little uh hidden solutions meeting. Boy, that'd be that'd be beautiful. I would be honored to do that. And because a lot of people they're stuck, you know, and they just need somebody to shake their brain yeah. a little bit <laughs> and get them unstuck. And, you know, you can't you can't get that from hanging around your same friends and your family because you know, you've been hanging around in your life, and you're still stuck, right? You got to go to somebody that's already outside the box, somebody that that's not struggling with the same problem that you're struggling with, somebody that you don't talk to every day, because those people need to shake you out of your reality. I call it shaking the globe. And you know, when I say shake the globe, I'm talking about you know, it's, it's getting to be Christmas time. You know, those little globes, those snow globes. You know, you buy them at, at the store, and it's a picture of a, a little house or a little church, and there's people walking. And when you look at them on the outside, it's perfect, right? It's like, wow, what a picture-perfect little setting. And there's snow on the ground, and nothing's happening. It's, it's pretty, it's cute, but it's boring, right? Until you do what? You shake the globe. And when you shake the globe, something magical happens. Because all of a sudden, there's beautiful, sparkly, you know, glittery things falling out of the sky, and it just, it's just magical. And sometimes when we get stuck in life, you know, it's, it's because we need somebody to shake, us, shake our globe. And they need, we need somebody to take us out of our mindset, take us out of our environment, and grab us by the shoulders and say, what are you thinking? Why are you hanging around these fools? Why are you doing life this way? There's spinach in, in your teeth, man, and everybody sees it but you. I'm the guy that's going to show you the spinach between your teeth. It might be embarrassing. <laughs> you may not like it. But you know what? We're going to shake you out of your current reality so you can start seeing the solutions that are literally all around you. We're going to open the eye of the brain. All right. Well, Daniel, with that said, I mean, Dan, uh, we have to bring the, uh, the interview to an end. We got to do this on a Friday. We, we scheduled to do it last Friday. We, we got to do it Friday. That's a whole different audience. And, um, okay. Let's do it Friday. You got it, man. We gotta, let's, you got it. So let's talk and schedule a Friday when we could uh, do this again. Okay, we'll um, do it, man. Man, I want to thank you, Daniel. Let me get your website, Daniel. I mean, yeah, HiddenSolutions.com. Very easy. HiddenSolutions.com. Okay. HiddenSolutions.com. And you said that you're going to give a list of books. I think the book to start with is Hidden Solutions All Around You. Your book is a great book. Hey, book I like with. that. <laughs> All right. All right. So listen, I'll be in touch. Continue success. And uh, thank you for being here today. It was, it was awesome. Dan. Thank you so much, Rick. Castro. I appreciate the honor. All right. Talk to you soon. Okay. Bye-bye now. All right now. Wow. Dan uh, Castro. That was pretty cool. That was very cool. I really appreciate that. Well, I'm out. I'll see you next Friday. Got a nice show lined up. Got guests lined up already for next Friday. I'll see you then. Continue success. Continue blessings. And continue to support the businesses that support you. You're hearing most of the shows talking about they're doing fun. This is fundraiser time. Support these shows. Support what's in your hand. Support the other shows. If you want what's in your hand and continue to be on this radio, support what's in your hand and support the other shows. All right, I'll see you on Friday with another incredible show.
I live my life wrong, and I don't want this to happen to you. If you listen and take evasive action, I can help you change your future. The following few moments may very well change your life, and I wish someone had told me this when I was your age. Our intention is everything. Nothing happens on this planet without it. Not one single thing has ever been accomplished without intention. You already in pain. Use it. Do something with it. Allow it to take you to the next level. Allow your pain to push you greatness. I said, empty your mind. Be formless, shapeless, like water. Now you put water into a cup. It becomes the cup. You put water into a bottle. It becomes the bottle. You put it in a teapot. It becomes the teapot. Now water can flow, or it can crash. Be water, my friend. Once you get a, to a place of clarity, once you become clear, you operate in a way that you cannot operate when the stuff is all over the place.